Thank you, Teresa. So without further ado, a very warm welcome to everybody to our webinar today focusing on dismantling the stigma of disability, part of the Clifford Chance Inclusion Series. Um, we're really privileged today to have a great lineup of speakers, all of whom have a connection to this topic. So first and foremost, our sincere thanks to those people, to our speakers for taking the time to speak to us today. And um, we really hope that you, our listeners, will find the discussion informative. Um, and we really welcome any questions you have uh, that may arise during the discussion. So please post those in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, before we start the discussion, I'd just like to ask Tiernan Brady to say a few words on the Ukraine. So over to you, Tiernan. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you everybody for today. Um, I, I'm Tiernan Brady. I'm the Global Director of Inclusion for the firm. We just wanted to say something at the very beginning uh, about you mentioned Ukraine. You know, I, I, and again, when I say events, you know, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, so it's really important that we thought long and hard about the events that we have been doing around inclusion. We build a very large inclusion calendar here in the firm. We talk with a lot of you know partners and clients uh, around inclusion events. And there's a discussion about you know what should we do in at, at a moment like this, um, and we obviously discussed whether events like this should go ahead, and, and we came clearly down on the side that they should, because when it comes to inclusion, actually, you know so much of what inclusion is, as, and you'll hear this today, is tied into our humanity and our solidarity, um, and if anything, at a moment like this events that highlight that humanity, events that highlight that need for equality and people's lives to be treated with equal value, uh, not just an equality of opportunity, but an equality of experience and equality of access. You know, we really feel that this is part of the conversation that should be happening now and that hopefully these type of values discussions that we're having help amplify um, wider topics and wider events, you know, such as the terrible events following on from the invasion of Ukraine. So uh, we just wanted to say at the beginning that we have thought through our rationale for why events like this should continue. And, and of course, you know, all our thoughts and, and so much of the support that we can give continues to flow towards, you know, the people of Ukraine. So uh, we hope that you enjoy today and we hope that it does connect it, it, uh, as you think through what does this mean for everybody everywhere? Because if inclusion isn't for everybody, then it's not inclusion at all. David. Thank you, Tim. That's really valuable. Thank you for those words. Um, okay, so I guess starting, I, I think it'd be great that we introduce ourselves and if you feel comfortable sharing your own personal story to this topic. So over to you, Martin. Yeah, I'm Martin Klem. I'm general counsel of Software AG. I'm white Caucasian male. Um, I'm disabled myself. Uh, I'm a quadriplegic, uh, confined to the wheelchair with no finger function. So I bring both perspectives to the table. Uh, the one from uh, management as well as the one from being a subject to inclusion and uh, therefore i'm very happy to be here today great thank you martin and renee yeah hello everybody my name is renee schmidt peter i'm professor for business administration and management and but i also studied social ethics and philosophy and that was due to a personal experience we are not I'm got a disability, but uh, a close friend of mine. And for me, it was always important to make bridges, you know, to find ways how we can achieve social goals like inclusion and social cohesion and also solidarity, but not against business, but with business. So it's really this integrative perspective, which I always was interested in. And that's what I have done for the last 20 years, how to bring business to social issues, but also how to solve social issues by business approaches. Perfect. Thank you, Renee. Very excited to hear more. Um, over to you, Sarah. Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Sarah Schermerhorn. I'm a lawyer at Clifford Chance and working in the employment group in Amsterdam. And uh, when I joined Clifford Chance in 1999, uh, diversity was one of the core values. And I was very happy to uh, be welcomed in a very diverse workforce, but I'm much uh, where I much enjoyed uh, the diversity of people. Um, but I was not so, uh, I found it very inspirational and, and uh, nice, but I was not so much aware of the business meaning, if you will, of diversity. 
And it was only later when we had a tra trainee from a, uh, from a different cultural background um, who had such a different view on a certain legal concept that we discussed that I realized that indeed uh, people may have other perspectives and that it's so valuable if we can combine these perspectives and that indeed the value of diversity is also that it will lead to better decision making. And um, since then, basically, uh, diversity and inclusion is a topic that is very close to my heart, and I'm very happy to join this webinar today. And as, of course, disability is an issue of diversity as much as anything else. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Tienan. Um, oh, I can argue about being leashed. I'm, I'm okay with that occasionally. <laughs> I, I, my name is Tiernan Brady, as I've already said. I'm the Global Director of Inclusion um, at Clifford Chance. Um, I, I, and really, I suppose the, the perspective, hopefully, that we bring to this day as I came to the firm from the world of campaigning, um, specifically campaigning for people who, who did face marginalization. Um, I was the director of the marriage campaign for equal marriage in Australia. Um, I should say on the yes side, I'd be a very unusual hire if I'd been the leader of the no campaign. Uh, I, and before that, I'd been the political director of the Irish referendum on marriage, but thankfully, both of which were successful. But both of which were so much about how do you campaign and how, what does campaigning look like when you're trying to build this, you know, dismantle stigma uh, and introduce a quality of law for people. So hopefully that campaign aspect today, along with all this brilliant legal and academic expertise, will, will, uh, will create an, a, an extra dimension for everybody. Perfect. Thank you, Tim. And once again, thank you to all of our speakers. I guess then diving into the discussion, you know, one of the main things we wish to achieve today with in our discussion for our listeners is to educate somewhat on, on the topic of disability, because it's something that I think people often don't understand. And I think we're, we're curious to begin with to hear a bit about the historical perspective. So to what extent has the landscape in disability rights changed in, in recent time? And how has that perhaps played out in your in your own institution? Um, perhaps over to Renee, you first, to give us your perspective, if that's okay. Of course, we are living all in a very dynamic world right now, and many things are also changing for the better. So for example, in academia, we have now much more data uh, also to do research. And at the last United Nations report showed that over 1 billion people in the world are having some kind of disability. So we are really talking about uh, a, a major group as well. Uh, and of course, uh, we know much more about their needs, but also about their capabilities. And we found out that uh, disabilities are not only negative, it, they also can bring, as already said, diversity on the table. And we can see more and more business models developing out of those kind of uh, yeah, disabilities, and I can bring later some examples. So I think there's some better understanding also in academia as well in the business world, but also on the political level. Uh, you, as you probably know, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are agreed on by all countries in the world, also by the United Nations, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and it is pretty clear that at least 11 out of those 17 goals are somehow also uh, related to social inclusion, to disabilities. So if you really want to achieve a sustainable goal, and we all agreed to develop a so sustainable and a peaceful world in the future, uh, I think we, we have to focus much more on the social dimension. And this is, of course, what's happening right now. We are seeing not only the ecological challenges like climate change, but you also see a lot of the social challenges we are facing. And in the beginning, we heard also about the geopolitical problems and challenges we have. They are also related uh, to social issues. So I think inclusion and uh, also integration of people uh, with different uh, abilities, so to say, are becoming a really important issue now on the corporate, political, as well academic agenda. And that's all happened very fast over the last three, four years. And I'm pretty sure this will continue. And I think this uh, discussion comes at the right moment. Thanks, Renee. And, and Martin, how does that look from your perspective? Um, I think Renee has pretty much captured the landscape. Uh, probably worth mentioning is uh, that I think uh, disability and diversity has become more of a topic in the war for talents. Um, so that uh, actually we have um, at least a tendency uh, 
uh, of uh, positivity around this uh, and an eagerness of organizations uh, to actually um, open up this market for themselves and opening themselves up for this market. So I think that's another important change that we've uh, witnessed recently. Definitely. And I know, Sarah, you, you have experience here and you've, you have your own views. Uh, how, did, how does it look from your perspective? Yeah, I think I, I may have a bit of a sim symbolic uh, example of how the landscape changed. Um, our offices in Amsterdam have re recently been renovated and it has been because of the uh, input of our enable network. So literally uh, a group of people who enable people with a disability or a long term uh, injury to try that give a chance that there has been genuine attention uh, for the accessibility of the building. Um, and that has resulted in that people in a wheelchair can now uh, enter the building through our impressive front door, whereas previously they had to go to the site uh, entry and ring a bell and, uh, well, would hope that someone would answer the bell and help them to enter the building. And I think that is a big step forward and although symbolic, basically saying it all. Um, for some years now, there is a, a worldwide trend, I guess, that people from underrepresented groups have a louder voice and um, I think it's very good to have networks where people sharing characteristics or experiences unite so that they can together voice issues they come across and raise awareness so uh, which is all absolutely and I Tina I know you, you know you you come from a marriage equality uh, background but what's your perception of, of the disability landscape in that time and moving forwards I think it's found a whole new energy, especially in the last couple of years. I mean, obviously, it should have had it all along, but you know, that's a, that's admiring the problem afterwards. Um, I, I mean, I think when we think about inclusion in workplaces, what probably started as a conversation about gender in most places, uh, and over time, we've seen that grow into the probably the next phase of that several years ago or several decades ago, depending on where the firm was or what company, you know, into LGBT, then into ethnicity uh, and cultural heritage. Uh, and it's only really in the last, I, I think in the last few years that you really see that energy in workplaces starting to build up, thankfully, around this and, and the formation of affinity networks and the you know, greater visibility. And um, we can see that even you know, internally here where our own global enable network is, is the baby of all the networks that we have. Um, but it's also one, you know, it's a very loud baby, which is great. Um, I mean, because it's, it's got so much energy. And, and what's, what's fascinating about it is seeing how much people are connecting to it. And the huge, because so much of it's about creating visibility of human story uh, and the reality of that and the reality. Because, you know, I mean, Renee says, I mean, the figures are huge, but so much of that disability is hidden. Um, and in our workplaces, that means that it has not been spoken about and that the majority of people who probably have some some form of what would be described as disability um, haven't told that. It's a hidden one. Uh, so, so the emergence of the networks and the emergence of the focus is, is you know, the next phase of inclusion, definitely. But you, you can really feel the energy coming into it. And I think that I mean, I think that's the first bit. And, and the second bit, you know, the really important that that does happen right now because I keep thinking you know what a moment for us to imagine prioritization of uh, you know a, a quality of access for everybody in the workplace when we've just literally spent two years all being sent home to our kitchens and our sitting rooms and now we're all being sent back again or we're being sent partly back again so we're moving into this world where we'll have multiple workplaces and of course if you have access check questions, then that's a huge issue. Um, and, you know, I, I think sometimes, and I know I actually mentioned this to the people on the panel before, which is no relevance to everybody else who's listening. Um, but I think a lot of time when we look at inclusion, we sometimes go, you know, we, we think about what would the world look like if we had a blank page and lament the fact that we don't have a blank page. And you kind of go, well, actually, we kind of do have a blank page right now. So this is a total change in how people work. What a moment for us to be listening to our people uh, and making sure we're facilitating that energy that, that we can see so clearly once we tap into it. So I, I think it's, it's certainly the baby, but 
but that that youth in terms of the, the the attention it's getting you know isn't a reflection of you know where it comes in status or standing in terms of order uh, and we're seeing it really explode into the into the workplace which is fantastic i agree and i i like the idea of the loud baby tin and taking us taking us forward um in in the spirit of that and on in the spirit of a blank page um Sara mentioned some some very practical things that have happened in amsterdam um Martin, perhaps turning to you, I wonder what organizations should or could be focusing on to make things uh, more accessible and inclusive specifically for, for disabled colleagues. Yeah, I think um, um, Sarah mentioned the uh, technicalities. Yeah, So uh, physical access uh, is definitely one form of this, and that's uh, for me a given. We all need to work towards that target. Um, I think it's important to add another perspective as well, and that's uh, it has been mentioned by Tien and, and by Rene already, and this is the um, the positive aspect of disability. Yeah? So the difference of the perspective, um, the difference of the way we work, the way we approach tasks. Yeah, they, they can be anything from from planning ahead or resilience. Um, there are different perspectives and actually strength that are built based on the challenge. Um, that can bring us forward. And if we get this perspective into an organization, we suddenly understand that this is not the old dusty task of just creating access, it is actually gaining um, strength, gaining diversity to be better tomorrow. And this, I think, is as important as the physical access or overcoming other challenges uh, in that context. Thank you. And uh, Renee, you know, you, you have this unique view of, of, of kind of the, the, the wider industry, I guess, as in a management role. It, it, does, that, does that speak to you as well? What do you see? Yeah, I see that management right now, especially through the crisis, has changed a lot. Yeah, we are somehow seeing that we are, have been caught in trade-offs. Yeah? We were thinking you can have either sustainability or profitability. You can either be inclusive or Come, uh, have a like a like a uh, competitive working culture, and suddenly you see that those things are not either or. Yeah, so it's rather as well as and. Yeah, so we are getting much more to an end society where you can have both. Yeah, you you can be socially inclusive, you can be diverse, and even more profitable. Yeah, I think this is a change in mindset because in the old business administration books, it's always you have to choose. Yeah, but I think that's what also was said already. We don't have to choose. Yeah, we can change the world to make it a better place and at the same time also be profitable and also innovative and really change the, the business world. And I think when we learn one thing out of the pa pandemic, we just uh, suffered all, we see that things are not fixed. Yeah, so it's in our hands. And, and also, I can, as I said, bring a lot of business examples where suddenly business realizes if you are inclusive, if you have diverse workforce, you are even more profitable. Yeah, you can become more innovative. You can better address the needs of the customers. And so it's not an either or, and you should not think negatively about disabilities any longer because I would rather call them special abilities. Yeah, so people, they of course have special needs we need to address and we have to empower them. But at the same time, they also bring special abilities to the table and make the whole working team more successful. And once you realize this, I think you can much more openly and positively talk about disabilities and don't see it as a handicap like in the past, but rather a challenge once we address it and, and, and bring new solutions to it, we live actually in a better world. And I think this is also a huge part of a sustainability movement. Yeah? And I think that's also the next step that we really as a social oriented and as a, the social discussions need to be much more included in, in, in sustainability discussions, because there we always talk about the climate change, but we have so many social issues we need to address that I think the whole sustainability movement comes stronger with this kind of discussion we are just having. Absolutely. And, and, you know, taking that tin, I guess, and then spirit of this, this blank page that we have, um, how does that look from your perspective to, to, to really achieve inclusion with respect to our disabled colleagues and, and realizing the advantages and the benefits of, 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 of these unique talents? 
Um, uh, well, I mean, I think it's the first thing. I mean, is to, the, as businesses, we have to take seriously what, what everyone else in the panel has just said, that actually this isn't just nice to have. That that building an equal workplace with equal access and you know and, and opportunity and experience for people, you know, isn't some luxury item that you know we just can wheel out on certain days or that when times are challenging we put away. Um, and I think what's really interesting over the last two years, when you think about, I mean, all the events that have happened over the last two years, both from global pandemic and you know and geopolitics um, and uh, you know you huge inclusion issues that would have emerged originally from the killing of George Floyd in America and everything that reverberated from that. You know, these we've been on a roller coaster where employers have demonstrated very clearly whether they think inclusion is a luxury item or whether they understand that it's a core value that's connected to their success. Um, and I think the firms that have clearly you know, made that clear in how they have engaged with their people during the move to different homes and how we help people with facilities. You know, when they were suddenly working from home, having spent a generation telling them that they couldn't. Uh, and, you know, but with so much of that pressure, um, that shows whether that was real or not. And I think there'll be, a, a, first of all, a lasting legacy based on trust for the firms that got that right. And that will put them in a wonderful springboard position, you know, to go to the next level of of, of activity on that. Um, I think the other thing, I mean, it, you know, how do you, we, we need to be able to talk to business very clearly about, you know, I mean, I, I think about Martin and Software AG and, you know, I mean, uh, that that's just all about innovation. I mean, I mean, you're constantly inventing and creating, you know, cutting edge technology and, and ways to apply that technology. And, I mean, and the same I always think for a law firm. I mean, you know, myself and Sarah work in a law firm. I, I always think the law firms are, I mean, they're just gigantic problem solvers. And it's about how do you, you know, find the best solutions to the trickiest problems. And, and diversity of experience and diversity of thought aren't just nice things to have for solving problems. They're essential. Or else we all just end up coming up with the same old solutions because everybody in the room around the table come up with the same ideas because they have the same experience or the same schools and haven't come across the life challenges that create great innovation sometimes. So I think, you know, making sure we're clear in our messaging in a way that's believable uh, to management and to senior firms and to our customers and to our own people that they can see, no, this isn't something that we're just saying and that we're going to have a special day on International Day for people with disabilities or, you know, or, or you know, celebrate visibility on certain moments, which we should do. But actually, it's that it runs deeper than that, that, you know, as we think about our blank page, how has how have we written on that blank page in this great moment of change? You know, have people emerged from that experience feeling that they were put on the bottom rung because, you know, in a crisis, we can't be concentrating on, you know, all of this special attention and special access. Or was it the moment where firms went, actually, this is this is core right now uh, and we need to demonstrate this right now. Um, and I, I keep thinking of the other thing just because you asked me about the blank page. I mean, what an incredible opportunity for businesses to rethink um, the entire concept of what it means to be at work for so many people. And for so many people for whom the traditional model and the traditional workplace is either inaccessible, uh, you know, either physically or, you know, or even just culturally. Um, and, and that we can, you know, really take the learning from, first of all, the, the first phase, which was throwing everybody out of offices and sending them home, but now we can take all that learning and go, okay, well, we're, we're throwing you back in for at least a couple of days a week. So now you're going to have two workplaces or maybe three workplaces. And that's a massive opportunity for opening the doors of access to people who are living with different disabilities or have, you know, different challenges around equality of access. Um, and like you said at the beginning, I think if we miss that, we'll spend 10 years regretting it in five years time going, that was the time to redraw something because I, I think it's a wonderful moment where everything's up in the air. Um, and, and of course, the other bit about everything being up in the air is 
we don't know where it will settle. So I think it's really important with our blank page that we understand, well, we're not going to have all the answers right now if we draw it. We're going to learn a few more answers in six months. We're going to learn a few more answers in 18 months as this rolls out. We're going to see things that we didn't expect that are really cool and brilliant for accessibility. And we're going to see things that, you know, you, you suddenly realize, actually, that could be a problem in five years' time. We, you know, we should be intervening in that now. So I, I, I think one of the most important parts of the blank page is understanding we don't know everything yet, but we can start mapping what, you know, what, what, what would perfect look like or what would great look like, knowing that we're going to learn a little bit more about what the barriers or, you know, speed ramps towards it will be over the next couple of months and year or two years as, as we find this new, you know, flexible working, working from home, you know, you know model and what does it look like? Um, and I think one of the most important parts of that, though, is we have to listen to our own people because they will be the people that are experiencing this. And of course, everybody will have a slightly different experience. There isn't, this will be the pathway because actually for the 1 billion people or any talks about, that's a lot of pathways. That's a lot of different experiences that we have to try and capture. And we can't do that if we're just trying to control that from the top. So in a way, back to our enable networks or whatever we call those networks, you, you know, within our firms, this is a critical time for A, us to listen to them and B, to start empowering people to go, actually, we need to hear from you. You know, if, if you're not telling us, we won't know because we won't be able to guess. So building a really strong speaking up culture um, about issues that all too often have been terribly stigmatized. So people don't want to necessarily put their hand up and say, actually, um, and this is all the more true for people who have, you know, well, you know, hidden disabilities, you know, actually, I have a question to ask, or actually, you know, this isn't, you know, um, working for me because. So we have to work really hard, not just to, you know, to listen, but to actively create a space where people have confidence that we want to hear them. And that isn't always the case. And one minute on this one it isn't always the case because you know we can think we're great in our heads and we can have all these values in our heads but people come to work every day from the real world and the real world hasn't always treated people with an equality of access in fact we know that to be almost the opposite of the case you know more often than not you will see the lack of access and the lack of equality of access so if as firms we're not really actively communicating that to our people our people will just presume that we're going to give them the same experience that they had in the previous, you know, before they came to work today. So this is a really important moment to listen and to create a very powerful message from management. We need to hear from you. We want to hear from you because we're in this once in a generation chance of, of reimagining access and without your input, it won't be as good as it could be. Thanks, Tia, and I, I I agree. It's very valuable, and I think I guess thinking about those multiple perspectives, Sarah, you know, you you speak with clients in the Netherlands and across Europe every day. What what's your perspective on this issue from your multiple conversations? Yeah, I fully agree with the other uh, panelists, and there are opportunities out there. But what is necessary for all these organisations that the discussion should be started eh, to the extent that has not yet happened. And uh, the story should be told and experiences should be shared. And we at Give a Chance, for example, had uh, our lived experience series. Uh, and these were a very good start uh, for these kind of discussions internally. And in these series, uh, our colleagues with a disability or with a family member with a disability tell us about their uh, relevant experience. For example, how it is to work at Give a Chance, but at the same time, for example, raise a child with a disability. And it creates awareness amongst uh, your colleagues, but also understanding and also admiration. But I think very importantly, it may also encourage uh, your colleagues uh, and to self-identify them, for example, uh, with regard to hidden disabilities. So it is really important to have this discussion started and continue to discuss. And um, well, as, as Kieran said, with, with establishing these uh, networks, uh, you've, together you stand stronger, so that also 
uh, will help you. And uh, by starting the discussion and having these role models, um, that may help others to, to speak up. And I think we need uh, a lot of role models because we should not forget that there are many different types of disabilities and that uh, they all have their own challenges and opportunities. And uh, colleagues who are or consider themselves, for example, to be at the autism spectrum uh, may encounter different problems than uh, people with an uh, audio disability, for example. So it's important that many people stand up and that we uh, are open uh, to, uh, to hear their stories. And that's right, Sarah, both on the, the role model side being such important figureheads. And you also raised the point around self-identification, which I know sometimes is difficult or is often not 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 visible or present um i guess then thinking about that a bit further perhaps we turn turn to renee you know part of this has to do around around data privacy collecting data and data can be useful as, as a yardstick or a measure of success um but that's not always possible um what what are the what are the issues there and how do we encourage people to perhaps to to, to be more, to share their data and the hope that we can use that to move the dial. Of course, health data is always a sensitive issue and there is, of course, a legal perspective. I'm not a lawyer, so I won't go too much into this perspective. But on the other side, from a sustainability perspective, business companies uh, need to become more transparent. Uh, so more and more stakeholders are asking for certain uh, key performance indicators about your work culture, about people you hire with uh, special needs and disabilities. So basically, you have both perspectives. On the one side, of course, there is some protection of the private data, which is necessary. But on the other side, society stakeholders are demanding more transparency. And I think this is kind of this um, thing we now need to discuss. So how can we get this data in a way which is also in the interest of the people. And I think one way could be also to see this data not as negative so that the people are afraid of giving this data, but also make a positive case out of it. So ask what kind of special uh, abilities do you have? So how can we bring in this special issues? And as said, uh, for example, people with uh, visual impaired people, for example, they are very good in detecting breast cancer and they, they have already some special companies using these abilities. And once uh, people realize that those special abilities are positively interesting for the employer, I think they are more open to share it. And then of course, this also could be a good story for business to society to showing that this kind of special abilities are in the interest of business and not hindering or distracting business for doing uh, business. And I think there, this is a kind of a mindset shift we need to achieve. And then of course, uh, yeah, the data becomes more available. And for this, we can also make more positive. And I think digitalization as such can be a huge opportunity because uh, we can use digitalization to better empower people with disabilities, but also to make better use of this data in a positive way. Uh, and I think that should be our common goal. Yeah, I love those ideas. Um, we're very fortunate, of course, to know you may not be a lawyer, but we have two lawyers on, on the line. Uh, Sarah, Martin, what, what does this issue look like from your perspectives, if I may? Perhaps start Sarah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, of course, you will need to have this data, and uh, it's, it's, that's a difficult one because your ability to work is a sensitive data, as Rene already indicated. But to measure is to know. So basically, you would need this collection of data to have some sort of a starting point for your action plans. You want to set certain goals, but you also want to, to measure your success or see where you did not achieve your goal in order to see uh, the hurdles that you will need to, to overcome. Um, but um, well, collecting sensitive data requires the individual's explicit consent, and basically it should be freely given, which may be difficult in an employer-employee relationship. Um, and you need to provide information eh, on the purpose of the data collection. So yes, indeed, people could be encouraged to voluntarily share relevant data with their employers if they know uh, what it's for and that it's for the better. 
Um, but there, we should not forget that there are many other uh, methods to basically uh, measure uh, the inclusion as experienced by your employees. And for example, uh, anonymous employee engagement surveys may be a great source of information, um, as well as, for example, monitoring exit conversations and asking specific questions uh, on, on leadership style or the approach towards diversity uh, or inclusiveness. Um, and for example, also annual reports by confidential advisors um, may bring you insights uh, uh, on issues that, that are there uh, within your organization so that you can uh, make these action plans to see how you can, can overcome these. Thanks, Sarah. And, and Martin, uh, from your perspective? Yeah, I think uh, most of the topic's been said, but um, yeah, I think it's if it's around the consent uh, to use those data, um, we need to make it easier for people to consent. And that, for me, means that we need to establish role models. You can um, share success stories. You can create uh, networks of ambassadors that um, help people understand that there is a psychological safety around providing this consent. And uh, I think uh, for me personally, uh, the, these days really uh, provide an additional form of possibility to influence uh, um, our society and that is use of data. So where earlier we would have had to demonstrate for our rights, we now can use our data in order to really provide the impact and the information uh, that can be used as a steering element in our development of society. And I think this needs to be understood. Yeah? So the power of data is immense and uh, we simply need to help people uh, provide their consent or share their data because they feel safe enough to do so or even encouraged. Thank you, Martin. And I, I like the idea of psychological safety there, which is here, of course, really important. Um, TNN, I know you have lots of experience with, with data and have met various situations. Uh, how, how do we do that? Yeah. I think there's a couple I mean, there's a couple of points to make, David, because I think, you know, what Martin and actually what everyone has just said is incredibly sensible, incredibly important from a legal perspective, because this is a very tricky legal area. Um, but I, I, I think one of the important pieces about data is that we can't underestimate it. You know, when we talk about our values and inclusion, there is eight and a half billion versions of what that looks like, because there's one for every one of us. And we all have our own idea of what it is, which means if you're not using data to drive your strategy, then you're using hunches. Uh, and that's not a good way to proceed. And unfortunately, when it comes to our values, we really lean into our hunches sometimes. You go because you know because we believe in this so much. You know, I know what'll fix it all, uh, and that leads us down the wrong path. Sometimes you need to you need to start with good data to understand what are the barriers to you achieving your values. I I, I think sometimes we can think the second bit, and this is you know that it can be quite hard to ask this data legally in some places. But, but there's other ways to find, to, to gather data. You can use focus groups to gather data as well if, if there are significant barriers. You can use surveys to take a look at that. And um, you can, again, engage with your own individual focus, your groups and your networks, all the time gathering, you know, more and more data to try and measure both one of the quantity metrics uh, but also what's what's the qualitative insights into what people's actual experiences are, which sometimes just raw data won't give you. So I, mean, I think that's the first thing to say that if, if you're joining from a region or a country where you think you can't ask this at all, there's still ways to think about this. There's still ways to create other data that doesn't necessarily you know, mean you're going to have to sit down and, 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 and get everybody to try and persuade everyone to give you their data. The other bit of that, though, is if you are trying to do that, you have to build a really good campaign around that. For all the reasons that everybody's spoken about, you know, the stigma, the, you know, the, the attitudes towards, you know, different people with different experiences, you know, the lack, the need to build faith and trust into why someone is giving you what is very sensitive data, you know, data that people have spent their life perhaps keeping a secret. And now suddenly you're saying, um, I'd like your data, please. That, that, they're not going to give it to you if that's your approach. 
you know, you need to think about what's the, the, the campaign you build around messaging and confidence and commitment to what, why data is important, what your commitment to the person is, if they give you this data, how you're going to use this data, and then make sure you're also living into that promise of keeping the conversation going so they can see the connection between the data they gave and the outcomes and the initiatives that you're doing. Because I, I worry that we could reach a tipping point with data sometimes that if we just simply ask for it um, without understanding the cultural barriers, um, and if we just think that it's something that isn't precious, because I, I think this is, we have to come at this from the angle, this is such a precious commodity to an individual, and we're asking them to hand it over to us uh, and trust that we'll do something good with it. Um, and, and if we're not demonstrating that, what we end up is we'll end up going full circle in the wrong direction where people go, I'm less likely to give you my data because you've mishandled how you asked me for the data in the first place. So I know that, that's with my big campaign hat on, but I think campaigning is so important here because even when we get the legal structure right and the academic structure right, we need to understand that there's a lot of hand-holding and convincing and campaigning to do to get people to want to do something that they instinctively have not done perhaps in their entire life and, and, and rightly are cautious of. They should be cautious. The burden should be on us to persuade people rather than the burden being on the individual to tell us their problem. Um, I think, you know, making sure we keep an eye on that when it comes to data and understanding the barriers and understanding it's not just about flicking a switch, it's about holding a hand. Um, and, and that's when you really start to get the insights you need, which can you know drive real change. Thanks, Tina. That's a very, very positive outlook on, on this on this topic. And I guess then in that vein, um, part of what we want to achieve today is to kind of educate our audience about what they can do and how they can get involved. So how, in your opinion, can our, our participants promote uh, this topic and themselves create uh, awareness in their own spaces. I guess, Martin, I'd love to turn to you to start this one, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, it, it's all about role modeling. Yeah, so um, if you focus on on the value that diversity brings, which I think is more or less my headline for the newest developments in the recent years, um, then we are exactly where we need to be. And uh, if we can carry this into our organizations and if we can um, try help making this a topic outside of our organizations, then I think we will slowly but gradually um, develop into the right direction and people will understand that this is a necessity. It's, it's not an option if we want to be successful. This is a necessity moving forward and I can only share um, um, an example from my own uh, life. Um, if I want to get rid of a headhunter um, that bothers me, I simply tell them that I'm disabled. Typically it works. If three or four years from now, I do the same thing at the headhunter bothers me to call them back, then I think we're done. And that's a long way until there. Yeah. So um, let's really try to um, focus on the values and, and and bring them in our organization and into our society. And that's it, I think. Thank you, Martin. That, that's really incredibly powerful. And thank you for the anecdote. Um, Renee, how, how does this look from your point of view? I think with everything we, we need to stop. Yeah? And, and as we saying, we are leaving no one behind. I think this is a claim we, we need in a world which has so many uncertainties. Yeah, I think this is a ethical standing we all need to agree on, leaving no one behind uh, in politics, but also in business and academia. I think, uh, yeah, we need to hire people which are having disabilities. Yeah, I think uh, I heard many stories, as you just said, uh, companies are not interested, yeah. And I have cases where I see that companies didn't hire people with disabilities. Others did. They invested. They changed the office. They even gave them kind of a a blind dog, for example, whatsoever. So they invested, and they made very good experiences. Yeah. Though they, because they are getting a lot back from those people. Yeah. Because they are, of course, 
grateful, but they're also loyal. They are very hardworking most of the time, and they are really bringing a new perspective to the team. And once you start making these positive experiences, you, you see it differently because then you suddenly see people as what they are. People are not numbers. Every person actually is individual. Yeah, Every one person is different. So it's not only about people with disabilities, without disabilities. I think businesses need to learn that every person has special needs, special abilities. And of course, you can make out of most of out of your business by using this kind of special abilities people bring to your office. Yeah. And, and once you have this, I think, new worldview that it's all about humans, yeah, uh, more human centered, it's not about numbers, figures, it's really about persons and people, then suddenly also your uh, culture, business culture is changing. And as we learn now with all the crises we just experienced, what co counts most in a crisis is really the relations between people. Yeah, you can manage everything as long as you have sound, trustful relations among peoples. And we can now see it in a geopolitical perspective. If this trust, this, uh, yeah, this trust in each other, in, in people is, is lost, I think you can see everything is going down. Yeah. And I think so. I think if you really want now to invest and be prepared for the next crisis, and I'm sure many crises will come in the future because we have a lot of uncertainty ahead. I think invest in people and see every people or every person as an individual, no matter whether he or she is disabled or not, uh, see him, her as a person and try to empower this person, bring trust to the person and you will receive a lot back. And I think this will change the working culture. And as said, this is now a big change and opportunity that we experienced all the changes in the working places we can now really rewrite business history and also how management is done. And I think it's a great opportunity for new leadership, responsible leadership. And of course, leadership is important. Leaders who are doing it with as a good example and also empower people. And I think there's this big opportunity we're having now. And that's where we also need people with handicaps and, and, and also with disabilities. That's a correct word uh, to also help us uh, to, to achieve better in the future. So I see it as a big opportunity, actually. Thanks, Renee. Another very powerful and promising message there. Um, Sara, what, what, what do you think? How do we do this? Yeah, I think that nowadays you cannot do uh, without a diversity policy and sharing with the world where you stand on the diversity and inclusion and equal uh, employment opportunities also with regard to the war for talent. Um, but I think that we learn from this discussion that that should not be seen as a burden, yeah, but something good uh, going forward. And I think it's also very important that it should, should not just be paperwork, but that it's important that you live up to your values and that you educate your employees and, um, well, apply your policies and pr practices in relation to disability uh, inclusion, uh, which may not only uh, help to self-identify people, but also um, for employees and colleagues to spread the word and sorry to spread the word and help to drive change uh, where it matters, and uh, it's not easy. Yeah, I think that um, where disability is concerned, you um, there are some practical aspects. You will want to ask your employees what do you want to uh, do your job and to excel and. Uh, ideally, you would want people to come forward to you and tell you that, for example, they would like to have a room for, for themselves or that they need a place to disconnect uh, during working hours uh, where they can be uh, at ease. But not everyone may feel comfortable in asking uh, of, or in sharing those needs and these uh, comfort levels may fare right. So I think um, that is very challenging for organizations eh, to, to, to come to an approach that fits all. Uh, but it will help tremendously if at least the atmosphere is that the organization eh, uh, uh, breads that it embraces differences. Uh, there we get somewhere. So I think yeah, you should start a discussion and include also the groups that are, are underrepresented uh, in your organization. Um, they likely have another perspective, so they may add value to the solutions uh, to these uh, challenges. Thank you, Sarah.
that's that's also great and i guess a quick final thought from tina and we have a couple of great questions that have come in uh, which we hope to answer so tina okay i'll, I'll try to be quick as an irish person can be i suppose <laughs> I, I i think i mean uh, the number one uh, for me, I could again, I think the role model piece that Martin talks about, there's so much great stuff in those recommendations for, from, from all three there. Um, uh, I, I think the importance that leadership really have to build those campaigns that convince people that it's simply not enough to sit, to be good in your head. And that management have to realize they have to take those values and demonstrate them very actively for a group of people who have faced significant barriers and significant stigma. Otherwise, what you'll end up with is the best facilities in the world that nobody uses because they, they're just not sure this is the right place for them to use them. So that, that, that does require, A, of course, the listening, constant listening, empowering your networks, empowering your role models. But that campaigning piece has to come with it, that, that management have to understand this is a constant message, that you're always building confidence within your people that you need to hear from them, that your success is connected to hearing from them. Because, you know, everybody, like I say, comes to work from the real world, but they also go back to the real world every day. So if you only say it once, it's not sinking home. You, you, this needs to be a constant message of confidence building all the time. So don't underestimate the importance of building your campaign around this as well, because if you can build that, you're going to learn so much from people um, who are going to give you insights that that you will never get be able to garner otherwise. So, you know, knocking down stigma is a permanent campaign. So, you know, get ready to get get ready to be part of it and own your leadership role within dismantling that, whether you're the CEO or whether you're just a person on your team today or in a meeting. You know, we, you know, we can all be the leaders of, of, of that change. We're all breaking away that stigma all the time, but only if we choose to actively do it. You know, no good being just good in your head. Thanks, Tianan. Absolutely. Thanks for that final thought. Um, I guess in view of time, just turning to a couple of, of questions. Um, a couple have come in regarding around how do we, if, if colleagues wish to be inclusive and wish to speak about their, their, their with their disabled colleagues about their disability, how, how do we do that without possibly offending or, or saying the wrong thing? Um, perhaps, uh, Martin, would, would you uh, have any perspectives there, um, tips and so forth? Um, I think the most important thing is to be open and don't be shy yeah because uh, um, more often than not disability is treated with um, a form of care that actually looks away rather than looking at the problem so people will tell you what they want to share with you and what they don't want to share with you yeah and uh, they've been through this many many times so i think for me, uh, the best way to do it is as a child. Mostly the, the best talks about disability or about my disability I have is with children because they're incredibly open and they're, they want to know uh, what, what concerns you. So I think this is a good approach to take just as, as a measure. Thank you so much. That, that's, that's really great to hear. Um, would it Perhaps, Renee, I mean, you, you have multiple discussions uh, from your academic point of view or your, your own experiences. I think it was already an important answer to directly address it openly, but also with a real interest. Yeah. So because if you're really interested in the other person, uh, he will or she will feel it. And if you have a positive intention, as said, uh, people are open to discuss and also share their experiences. I think this is very important on the, on the personal level. But then, of course, also leadership uh, is very important from the top, so the whole culture. So it's not only about the disabilities, it's also a working culture where you also can share other things. Yeah, If you feel not good at the day, if you're sick, or if, uh, can you share it or do you hide it and you go to work even sick and not telling anyone that you feel sick? So it's all a kind of a working culture as such. And I, I think the more open 
And honestly, people treat each other the better it is uh, for the people with disabilities, but also for the others. And I think this we need to achieve together. I think this is very important. And one last thing is also uh, always have in mind that also customers are also having disabilities. I have said one billion people. So uh, the more uh, a business is also caring about different needs and abilities, not only among their workforce, but also their customers, the better they also connect to society. Yeah? And this is also good for future markets, for example. And don't forget, we are now becoming a more and more elderly society. So as said, disabilities will become even more natural to us yeah? because we will all hopefully become 100 years. But this, of course, will also go along with getting some disabilities. And I think this is also an opportunity to see this not as a burden, but really as an opportunity to have a growing get elderly society where everyone is integrated because we still need a lot of workforce, of course. And, and therefore this open approach to those challenges, I think is always better than not talking about it or, or trying to hide something because this does not show us the real picture of the world. And the, the, the real picture of the world has positive, negative side. And that's what life is all about. And the more you are having this open approach, also the more you grow internally. Yeah? It's also good for your personal development yeah? uh, because this is also what life is all about. Not only the external world, but also how you treat yourself. Yeah? We didn't really talk about this. How do you treat yourself? Because uh, sometimes I'm also having some disabilities. Yeah, I feel bad or whatever. I'm, I'm kind of a little bit distracted and, uh, and maybe we should all become more open about the real needs we all have and then our world will become more human and hopefully bad things like we are seeing right now will not happen again and we become much more inclusive. I think this is maybe the picture we should have and, and as said, leaving no one behind could be also a good uh, motto for this. Thanks, Renee, and thanks again, Martin, for those really positive, promising final thoughts. I guess we would be at time now so a very hearty thank you to our, our speakers today and to all our attendees to attending. We really hope that you found it a, a great discussion, inspiring, thought-provoking, and we very much hope to see you again on a future webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.